up, get out right out of your bed, that's your quicksand. Getting rid anxiety in head, you can fix it. Rid of stigmas, all of them you said, we ain't listening. Just remember, try to do your best, you can win this. Maurice Bernard, State of Mind. Hello, State of Mind. My name is... The Space Cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> Some people call me the Space Cowboy. Okay, no. I can't sing because YouTube will shut me down. Um, so listen, this, uh, if you like what you see today, we got a very intense individual. Hit the subscribe button right here because we're trying to get to, you know, 200,000, which is great. Thank you, guys. You guys are the best. Um, this is the first, I've done over 300 of these and this, I think this is the first time that I don't have notes. Wow. Just because the person I'm talking to is a friend of mine and I've known him for many years. Um, I want to talk a little bit about acting because, uh, you'll see why. I'm starting to get into it again. Here's what I did on GH. Why? Because I started to feel like. I guess I started to feel like acting was was making me have anxiety or it felt didn't feel good anymore or why am I doing it and this and that and and then I said let me let me change up the character's energy. Let me go back to the old Sonny when I first started. And ever since I started changing Sonny's energy I'm having I'm having a lot of fun again. And it's really, it's been great. I'm just getting in there, and I, it, it's just a matter of ch a little bit of a change. And now I'm like, <laughs> as opposed to, what, what I think what I was doing was I didn't want to go there because of anxiety. And the reality is to go there is better for the anxiety. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> okay. So anyway, I have somebody here today who, at, some, at one point, General Hospital, the show that I'm on, was, they had an acting coach named, well, I'll give you his name in a second, who I believe was the, the, the incredible thing to have on anything, but especially on a soap opera with a lot of young actors. Now, you have to understand, things have changed. So, you know, you don't have an acting coach now, you don't have the lighting that you had, you don't have directors coming out and speaking to you for 20 minutes, not even one minute, because of it, it, obviously it's all money, always all money, right? But he was the acting coach, and I think if you look back and you saw the young actors, uh, uh, not Steve, but <laughs> all, all, all the young actors, they were so great. It was like we had an ensemble. Like uh, I remember, I used to, I used to go to the actor's studio, right? And I had friends from the actor's studio, and they used to say. Why are you doing a soap opera? Why are you doing a soap opera? And then when they watched, once I got on, they're like, get me on. That's like a movie, you know. Anyway, uh, his name is John Oma. <laughs> John Oma. How you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. How are you? Let's talk about... Let's talk about that for a second. The, the, well, the, the, the early years of hey, when you got on. And when I first got on... Um I knew Mark Tishner, uh, cast yeah. director of GH. Um, Ten Emmys. I knew him in New York. Right. Right. Uh, as an actor. Then I came out here, and because of a lot of things, uh, I wasn't acting anymore. And, you know, and that was devastating in and of itself. But um, started coaching and all of a sudden got really hot, you know, with it. And I just came back from uh, doing a movie. I was in London. In fact, uh, it's funny. It's uh, 30 years, man. 
uh, January 17th, the earthquake in uh, Northridge. I yeah. Was in, I was in London doing an uh, interview with the vampire with Kirsten. Yes. And that put me on the map. That put her on the map, put me on the map. Yeah. So I came back. Wait, wait, let's talk about that experience. <laughs> you were there? Yeah, well, I was in London. London? Yeah, I was at Pinewood Studios, and um, I worked out of a place called The Shop over on Burbank. Yeah. And I remember trying to fax something back to my partner, and uh, I walked into the hotel, and they said, uh, you know, Mr. Homer, your faxes aren't going through. And I was like, oh, okay. Andy forgot to blow the machine. So I call up, and it says, due to the earthquake, um, all the lines are down, blah, blah, blah. I mean, what earthquake? I turn on CNN International. It looked like Los Angeles was on fire. Yeah, it was bad. So I booked at home and uh, got back, man. It was, you know, devastating. But, yeah, that's just a couple of days ago, the, the anniversary, uh, January 17th. It was crazy. It's been that long already. You know, when, when that thing hit, I was in bed with Paula. And, <laughs> yeah. And I hear uh, car alarms, and I, I literally thought it's the end of the world mm -hmm. because it, we're being attacked, right? And then I heard, like, a stampede on top of the house, and that was the earthquake. Yeah. And then I went out, and I'm stepping on TVs and glass, and then I, I go into to see where my, my bulldog was and my dogs. They're not in the, the room the door had opened and I couldn't find them and my my uh, wall yep. collapsed so I thought they're dead yep and they were but they were all in the corner grabbed them lifted Man. them up my next door neighbor worked in uh, I was in Valencia at the time and unfortunately the horrible thing was a motorcycle cop coming down he didn't realize that that part of the yeah 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 the yeah meets was down he went off that he, that the yeah. Overpass. Yep, and it was what normally took me maybe an hour to get to you know work and stuff. Three hours now to get home. I mean, it was it was really devastating. You know what happened to a lot of people. My house, you know, fortunately was built on what they call a uh, cut, uh, and some are built on fill. Uh, but the cut it withstood pretty much everything because you're on solid. You yeah, know, yeah. Block underneath and the fill stuff. Well, like Santa Monica, because Santa Monica is on sand. And all those buildings, you know, that yeah, went down, yeah. that caused all the retrofit. But anyway, I'd come back from um, the interview with the vampire. It was a big movie. I mean, you know, Huge. a lot of, you know, weight on that one. And, you know, you're working with Cruz and uh, Brad Pitt. and uh, Were they uh, cool when you were helping? Tom Cruise, I got to tell you, was one of the most generous people I'd ever met. Wow. And it's funny. I uh, I went to the premiere, and I hadn't seen uh, Tom in a while. And uh, I walked in, and uh, he was walking in with Nicole, and we kind of bumped into each other. I went, hey, man. He went, hey, man. And I went to shake his hand. And he put his hand right out, and I said, John, how are you? And all of a sudden, he just <laughs> grabbed on. Oh, my God, how are you? Cut to last year Mission Impossible premiere. Yeah. One of my students went to it, and he came in, and she started talking to him. She goes, my coach um, is John. He goes, oh, my God, Kirsten's coach. Uh, no, she said, uh, is Kirsten's coach from the interview. And he, that fast, went, Damn. John Homa. And the guy's amazing. Damn. You know, because sometimes maybe I, uh, directors or actors would have a problem with an acting coach on this well, there was. It's funny because I got over to Pinewood and, um, uh, sorry, I don't really want to go into it, but all of a sudden, uh, I guess Pitt's coach had a problem. Ah. And now they were like, uh, hold on, you know, about going in and work. I said, no, believe me, talk to her. Yeah. And uh, let's not have a problem. And they cleared me right away. But yeah, but yeah it, it's, it's difficult. It, well, well, Neil Jordan. Okay, let's talk about this. 40,000 submissions for the role of Claudia. They, we started the audition process. 40,000? Submissions, okay? All over the, you know, the world, really, basically. Uh, but London, uh, Ireland, uh, you know, San Francisco, Philadelphia, all the major cities. So I got wind of it 
like the beginning of the year in 93, I started reading the book. You know, I read it a bunch of times. Finally got our first draft. And, you know, it was an Anne Rice novel and then an Anne Rice script. And David Geffen jumped on board and it became a Ge David Geffen movie. Then Neil Jordan, the director, he jumped on board now. Neil Jordan, and he wrote one of the other drafts. So right. I'm reading everything. We started, I think Kirsten had her first audition in April. And she didn't get cast until almost September. So think about that. My big worry was she kept getting taller. We had her in little heels when she first walked in. Now she's in ballet shoes because she said, don't get tall because the character's only five. Uh, now, and it came down to, uh, but then then you had the first taping process, and um, that was like one of my first you know, self-tapes going back to 93. And, you know, the closer we're getting, and now it's like the sixth, you know, audition, and it's, it's getting damn. really tense. And it ends up coming down to two little girls after all that. They put like between two and 3,000 kids on tape. And then finally you get to meet Neil and go in. And then the screen test happened. And I told Kirsten, I said, look, don't, I'm, I'm going to go to the screen test. I went in with her mom. I said, but I don't want anybody to know I'm here, right? I, I don't want to get thrown out. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't know. I hadn't really met, I hadn't met Neil. Well, Geffen's there. Steve Woolley's there. I mean, Cruz was there. Uh, now, Brad wasn't there. He was doing a movie. So um, uh, Joanna Colbert was casting director. And I'm writing notes, but me and Kirsten had a little hand thing going. But I said, when, when Neil talks to you, don't look at me. You know, you you stay on him. I'll I'll talk to you later. Well, David Geffen's looking over my shoulder. I'm writing notes, and I'm like, I'm not supposed to do it. And um, all of a sudden, Joanna walks over and she said, um, "Neil wants to talk to you." No, They're throwing me out. And look, I I, I was I coached maybe I coached uh, the last Boy Scout with Willis and uh, yeah. and, and, and Damon Wayans, the little girl in that. Yeah, but I was nobody, nobody, and. Um, all of a sudden, here comes Neil Jordan. I'm like, oh, no. He goes, I hear you're a good actor. I went, I'm an acting coach. He goes, I hear you're a good actor. Where are we going with this? He goes, this guy is a plank that's playing Brad's part. No offense to the guy. I don't know who he is. I don't remember. But he was stiff as a board. He must have got in a panic thinking, oh, my God, Cruz is here. Yeah, Here's yeah. my big chance. Well, all of a sudden he freezes up, and Neil says, "Can you read the scene for me?" Oh boy! And I'm like, um, "I said I don't need it." I said, yeah. "So we got three lines in." He goes, "Would you do this?" And I said, "Not my audition. It's Kirsten's audition. Ask her. <laughs> Ask Kirsten." She starts crying. She goes, "He'll make everybody better." And I said, "But think about how good you and I'll be in this thing." And next thing I know, I'm in. Full period. I mean, it was a no. full period. I did a screen test with her, right? And it was so real. After all this time, oh. and there was one scene where she's like, you know, Louie, and she throws herself in my arms, and she's sobbing. And I'm holding her, and I can't hear a sound. And I'm like, was that good? <laughs> Were we good, Louie? Any good? And then a little bit I hear not full tiptoes. Next thing I got a hand on my shoulder, it's Tom going, good job, man. And next thing I know, I'm sitting in a chair like you, Neil Jordan's sitting on the, with his arm over my knee. And I'm like, I almost start crying. Cause I went, she got it. She got this. Did they tell her right there? Uh-uh. And we went up to Formosa Cafe, which was over at Warner Hollywood and uh, went up uh, got a cocktail, uh, her mom, uh, and we found out the next day she got it. Damn. And Neil called me up, and I went over, and I walked around Warner Hollywood with him. And he said, John, I'm not taking you, like, to go to coach on the whole movie. I said, I don't know. I'm not what? I'm not taking you, like, as coach on the movie. Oh. No, I'm coaching Kirsten, but no, I'm not. He goes, oh. He goes, here's why, and I already knew why, because... I was her only connection to acting at that point. Right. For real. And he said, I can't talk to her and have her look at you. That's exactly what I told her about the screen test. 
I said, Neil needs your full attention. Yeah, and, why? But he, we walked around Warner Hollywood, and I told him about her. I said, look, you're going to get there. I ended up in New Orleans. In fact, I was in New Orleans. I missed my daughter's birth because all the uh, opening scenes were in, in daylight. So I did go to New Orleans, you know, with them and, and, and worked down there. Then I did go to uh, Pinewood for a little bit. And, um, but uh, I said, look, when you get a take out of her and you're going to celebrate because you're going to think, oh, my God, how lucky did I? Wasn't luck, pal. Ask her to do it again. And you're going to get another one better and ask her to do it again. You better. I said, this is a work. She's a workhorse. And she loved it. And every take will get better, bud. I said, you, you, you got lucky that she walked into your room. But don't think that you got lucky on set that you got a good take out of a kid. She was amazing. Flat out. It was great. So anyway, I come back. And I get a phone call from Teshner. You know, we'd like to talk to you about coming over to you know, General Hospital, I'm like, fuck me. You know, I, I, I did a couple of, you know, after that I did uh, uh, Jumanji. I worked on uh, Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah. Doing like some A-list shit, you know. Next thing I know, I'm getting called over to General Hospital. And I did not have any desire to do soap opera. As an actor, I did Edge of Night. This is, this is dating me. Right. Uh, right. I did the freaking doctors, you know, in New York, yeah. and, you know, that kind of shit. But I, it, it just, you know, the block and tape, see, uh, Edge of Night, you got there, every actor got there first thing in the morning, right? Yeah. I don't know if you know this and how they did, they worked. I did it in New York, too. And what you did was you, you sat around, you drank coffee. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You worked on your scene you, with the director, you wrote notes. Then you go downstairs and yeah. hey, you come back up and uh, you do a, a, a block rehearsal or a, a walkthrough. Then usually you went to lunch because it's every scene yeah. you're doing. And it's shot, it's shot in a circle. And But you were there all day long, man, and you rehearsed yeah. and rehearsed. Yeah. Then you go into wardrobe and they had lighting and it was great. I mean, it was like theater because yeah. you're rehearsing. So by the end of the day, you just went around the room, boom, 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 boom. Right. Every scene was done. I worked in the doctors. It was block and tape. Yeah. And I'd never seen that before. I yeah. walked in there, we, you know, a couple of run throughs and uh, we're taping. I'm like, wait, that's it? Yeah. And there's no one's listening to me, you know, if I want another take. You just, no, we got you. And out you go. Coming out here with General Hospital, it was the same thing. And I literally went to Wendy Rich, and uh, who was just an amazing human Fantastic. being. Uh, and Mark, and I, out of respect to Mark, I went over to kindly say, you know, Thanks, but no thanks. So I wasn't interested. Man, I walked in there, and Wendy, she said to me, I want you to help raise the standard of acting in daytime television. I was like, oh, okay. Like, you don't want, no, we don't, we don't want soap. You know, and that was right up my alley. Yeah. Because I was as intense, you know, I was, I'm good now. I mean, back yeah, then, I was yeah. nuts. Um, I wanted what you were doing. Yeah. See, and then I saw you, and they told me you were off limits to me. Right. I couldn't even talk to you. <laughs> I was just Maurice, and nobody could talk to Maurice. Well, I and, was intense and dark no shit. shit. You were. But see, that's where I wanted to be. And I'm working with, they, yeah. they brought me over for Kimberly McCullough. Yeah. Okay, to work with Robin Scott. Yeah. And you know, what I thought was really cool was most soap operas, they'll, they'll send you away at a certain age. Oh, he's going to Europe for whatever, or she's going to yeah. Europe. And then you come back a grown woman. You know, you're yeah. different, different yeah. back. Yeah. But they wanted to move Kimberly through this process and age her on the show, like in real time. And I was like, wow. I went there, I said, all of a sudden I'm changing my mind about this. Like, it, it's like I had no desire to do this. And after talking to Wendy and Mark, I, uh, I said, can I go down and hang around a set? Sure, go down. Remember Eddie Matuzak? Old Eddie? 
Yeah. He's down there spouting Shakespeare. Yeah. He doesn't know who I am. He grabs me by the shoulder and he, you know, he's hitting me with some Shakespeare. I'm going, what the hell's going on? The guy's like 80 years old. Right. And he still wants to come to work every day. And people are laughing. And yeah, the, yeah. And the cast are hanging out together. And I'm like, I gotta rethink this. And um, I said to Wendy, I said, look, can I come over for maybe big scenes? You know, just I didn't know what I was doing. And that's just Kimberly at that's that time. That's just Kimberly. All right. And then I went in, and so I started working with Kimberly. And people are now starting. They didn't know. The stage managers didn't even know who I was. You know? Yeah. I remember Craig McManus. Craig. I'm starting to Craig move into set. He comes in and grabs me by my belt and pulls me out of the set because I didn't know. I wasn't allowed yeah, to cross not, camera line. Yeah, right. And I'm going, dude, get your hands off me. You know? And then Wendy came to me, and she said, I'd like you to work with um, Vanessa. Oh, yeah. I said, Vanessa Marcel, Brenda Barrett. Yep. And I said, no. Why? I said, no, nah, uh-uh. I said. Because she wasn't I good? Said, she doesn't like me. Oh. I said, and, and she goes, it's funny. That's what she says about you. And I was like, well, wait a minute. So I could charge him down to the dressing room. Bam, bam, bam. What's the story? We got into a huge fight. No. Me and Vanessa. I didn't know this. And after that fight, I was in love yeah she and and she got to a point where she'd call me up on set and say and all the crews going you know because john homer to set and i get up and she'd say look at me and i literally I'd look at her and she start crying and wow. i went down that one day and i said is that she goes when i look at you i know i'm looking into the eyes of the one man that'll never hurt me wow and I'm done now. I'm, I'm done now. Right. And then um, the scenes that, and this was entrenching me in the place now, because now we're talking about 94, 95, um, mm -hmm. the, the Sonny Brenda stuff yeah. was really hot. Oh, yeah. And, you know, getting her to break that thing of hers was yeah. hugely important to you. Yeah. And then getting around you watching me work there then you and I came yeah. together right I mean not that I'm walking not that I'm walking over coaching you but no. I mean you would look at me at the end of takes yes. and just go and get the nod and right. move on and then we had the whole um, so you favorite. worked with Vanessa Kimberly and Michael Sutton, Michael Sutton. <laughs> okay and, and who else Wendy talked to me about that and she said look um we have a storyline coming up it's going to... Oh, the AIDS thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Line. And I was like, oh, you know, soap opera and AIDS. I said, look, we can't give lip service to this. I said, Wendy, seriously, I mean, if it's going to be a soap opera storyline on AIDS, I don't want to do it. I'm not... No, it's the greatest. It. it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Yes. Flat out. Yes. And Michael, I said to Michael, look, if you listen to me, I said, look, you're dying at the end of this, just so you know. Yeah. But I said, if you listen to me, you can walk out of here with an Emmy. Yeah. And he ended up getting an Emmy nomination. Emmy nomination, yeah. But then Burton came. To oh, me. do we have to? <laughs> yeah, we have to. Uh, Steve came over to me and all of a sudden wanted to work with me. Yeah. And Ricky was there. Ricky Martin was there at the time. I'm working Poor with Ricky, Ricky man. Try, I mean, Ricky, Poor so Ricky. my head's going to explode working with Ricky. With and then Sean Kane and, and Burton, and they're all fucking with Ricky. And I'm going, uh, you can't. I actually went to Jim Kane's dressing room and I'm knocking the door going, don't fuck with him. I said, it's, a, it, it's hard enough to get him up there because English wasn't his first language. John, it was so hard for me and Ricky because I would have, as Maurice, I'm in the scene feeling horrible for him. But as Sonny, I have to go, what, what, was, the, what was his name, Miguel? <laughs> was it Miguel? It was Miguel, right? I'd be like, I'd be like, Miguel. <laughs> You Do you remember how long his hair was? Yeah, it was long. Well, Vanessa being hip. Oh, but anyway, yeah, with Vanessa, though. Right. I said something. She's going to kill me when she hears this because uh, I love her. And uh, I, I coached I Cassius. I, I coached her yeah, yeah. for a long time. He's, um, he's, yeah, he's good. But um, Vanessa said something about why he didn't want to work with me. She goes, well, I see you over here, and you just stare at me. I said, I stare at you because I'm baffled. She goes, what do you mean? I said, there's things I want to do with Kimberly McCullough that she, you know, needs to know. 
I mm. mean, as far as craft and shit goes. And I look at you and I said, you have, you have absolutely no technique. Uh, and I, and you keep pulling these scenes out. <laughs> she was like, what? I said, yeah. I mean, it, there's, there's no craft here. Next thing you know, she wants to work with me. So we're working together. But I said, you have such a survival instinct mm -hmm. in you. And great that eyes. you will not fail up there. Right. And I want other actors right. to, that's why I stare at you. And I'm, I'm like, 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 where is this coming from? Man, I fell in love with General Hospital. Yeah. And they were great because I was, I'd go off and do a movie. I'd go do Jumanji or I'd go do whatever. And then I'd come back right to General Hospital. And then Burton. And Steve Burton, I got to tell you, my son ended up being his, his uh, ring bearer in his wedding. I mean, oh, really? We, me and him and Brian Presley actually had a, a business together over at CBS Radford. Right, I mean, we were right. really close. Right. Steve Burton would not let me leave. If he knew I was going off to do a movie or I was going to be gone for like six, seven days, he'd come to me with a yellow pad and a pen saying, Homa, write down the questions you would ask me. Yeah. So I can ask me when you're not here. And then Kanan came around. Yeah. I mean, look, all these actors, John, what they have, because I've worked with now so many, is the, the, the dedication and the hard work. More than talent. Yeah. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. And all everyone we're talking about, had it th yep. where they're they're gonna be great or at least strive to be great it pissed me off so much when i left and people that were my friends were what the fuck you doing what are you doing fucking soap opera oh god yeah i thought you were a serious yeah. acting coach and i'm going Guys. even then john because it was great show yeah. Look, I had, uh, in my class at the time, you know, Freddie Prinz. I had, uh, I coached, we had everybody. I yeah. Mean, I was coaching Michelle Williams. I was coaching, uh, later on, Brie Larson, um, you know. But all these young actors that went on to be, you know, big fucking stars. And, well, Tyler yeah. was in class then. But people looking at me and like, you're a soap opera. What are you doing? We thought you were serious. And I said, dude, do you have any idea? If you have four months or three months or even, even like eight weeks on a movie that you can rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and then get it fucking wrong. Right. I said, right. we're over here. My last day on the set at General Hospital, we did 176 pages in one day. It's, it's ridiculous. I'm telling people, uh, I worked on um, Spanglish. And um, Jim Brooks, James L. Brooks, who I love, he looked at me one day. I'm doing GH during the day, and I'm going out to uh, Malibu and doing Spanglish at night, right? And Jim looks at me. I'm holding a piece of paper. He goes, what's that? I said, oh, it's our shooting schedule for General Hospital. And Jim was really cool about the whole soap opera thing. And he goes, what's that for May? I said, Jim, so for tomorrow, <laughs> there were 52 items. Now, for those yeah. of you that don't know, uh, they don't call them scenes. They call them items. And what it is, is a long scene, because, you know, the in soap opera, or day, uh, what I like to call daytime television. Yeah. Uh, I said, I love daytime television. I hate soap opera. But I said, you take a scene and you fragment it. So you move away from that storyline to another storyline to another storyline, then come back to this one. Yeah. So it's not actually a full scene you're seeing you when you watch it on TV. You're seeing right. fragments, so they right. call them items. And I had to learn all that. And I had to really understand. So I would take the whole scene and lay it out, you know, take it out of the script and lay it out. So I had, I would write my own stage direction because there's not really stage direction in daytime. Not like, it's more like how you feel and the I face get, you're right. making, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't read that anyway, man. No. And uh, I would write in the stage direction for me. What are you doing? You know, what is this? Yeah. Because the word act, guys. It just simply means to do, yeah. to perform an action. So actors are doing what the character does, and that's what I would do. I would break the script down that way. What are you doing in the scene, and what do you want? Right. Because the want is the thing that truly is. Yeah. Th that's what the scene's about. And I don't care what the dialogue is now. You know, what I want is driving the scene. And I would have everybody breaking down scenes like that, 
uh, working with Burton, and I told him, I want you to think in one camera, not four. He goes, what do yeah. you mean? I said, look, you're going to move to film. Right. Which I really felt. Yeah. You could have moved to film. Yeah. Uh, but, well, yeah. no, for other reasons. Yeah. I mean, but as an actor, yes. you could have moved to film. Yes, absolutely. Um, Steve was the only person I know who had the more opportunities than anyone and decided he doesn't want it. Hell, Dream works harder than three times. I mean... Oh, I don't More be, power to him, man. I don't want to be in a rental house, you know. For, you know what, the, what the hell? You want to come back to your hospital? Which I, I took my hat off. It was to, amazing. You know? But uh, he became <laughs> one of the most still actors yes. I've ever worked with. Yes. I said, Steve, you stay still. The camera's going to come to you. Right, right. The audience is going right. to come to you. There would be, like, in the quarter main living room, everybody's running around like nuts. Yeah. Steve's like, Right, right. Right there with this freaking jacket. Yeah. I heard that was funny when he came back. He was coming back for the show. He said, uh, just give me the jacket. Yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was really funny. Uh, but anyway, that's how I got to General Hospital. Um, and they were really cool. And uh, I'm working with everybody. Even later, I mean, rest his soul, I'm working with Steve, uh, I mean, Stuart Damon. Yeah. When he had his drug thing. Yeah. And they were great storylines. I mean, Great story line, the, yeah. the AIDS storyline with you and, and Stone, um, Michael Stone. Nobody Stutton. can question that. I don't care if you're a movie actor. Or, I don't care, man. You can't question that. That's You show stuff to them, uh, that storyline. It's like... You know what I used to do in my class? I would take a scene from our show. And when you pick up a, a daytime script, you know, it, it's you know immediately it's daytime. Yes. I would take it and have it retyped. I would change the names. And I would write it out, type it out like a movie script. I'd give it to people in class, and they'd be like, my God, this is a great scene. Where's this from? I said, General Hospital. Oh, yeah, I don't like soap opera. <laughs> I'm like, well, you're an ass. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, Brian Presley, when he got Port Charles, was in my class. Yeah. And he had a fight with his manager um, about it because nobody wanted to do it. Yeah. You know, you're going to get pigeonholed. And I said, Brian, I'm on this show. I'm coach on this show. I will never let your ass get hung out to dry. I'm here. Believe me. Get up and get to work in front of a camera every freaking day. Yeah. This is the best schoolroom you'll ever have. Yeah. You know, is yeah. on this show. And we move fast. But even those days, what you were saying, we would do, I mean, Scotty, you know, would come out. Yeah. We'd do 14 takes. We'd rehearse, he'd talk, he'd sit down, he'd, he'd nah, talk nah, to you. Not, nah. not Joe, who I nah. loved. Um, now it's one take. Oh, baby, and you're lucky, you know? And, yeah. And I'm telling people, you got to learn to rehearse hard now. Ooh. Yeah. Rehearse hard down. That's right. That's right. You, okay, you can't have your first uh, actual taping be your first rehearsal. No. Because that's what it used to be. That's right. And That's would, what I told Joshua. I said, Joshua, your, your rehearsal... Is your first take. That's it. That, and and I, treat it that way. But yeah. Because you don't get any. Yeah, and it would drive me crazy when people would walk through it. And you know how it worked. The cameras and stuff were more important. You know what I mean? Performance kind of came last, it seemed. And not to me. Yeah. But we work really hard downstairs. And then come up ready to shoot. Yeah. That, that's what I liked. I, and then what do we do? We run right back downstairs after we shot and watch it. I know. Watch your shit as it happens. I that was, was that was like dailies. I, you know, it's funny. You know, you you think about people getting up in the daytime. You know, civilians. I call them civilians. Yeah. You get up in the morning. The first noise out of them. <sighs> you know, they don't want to get a bed. Right, right. You know, I would get home because I did uh, GH, and then I would intersperse it with private coaching. Yeah. You know, during yeah. the day, uh, when he was kind enough until things changed. And then I would leave there and go teach class. I taught class every night after I left General Hospital. Amazing, dude. And um, I get home at night sometimes, midnight, you know, twelve thirty, and I have to do homework for the next day. I mean, and get up again because I, I wanted to see my children. So I get up at six o'clock in the yeah. morning, get them, uh, see them before they went to school. I was so happy driving down. I couldn't wait. Yeah. I could not wait to get to work. Because it wasn't work. I'm going to I'm going to play yeah. with my buddies yeah. all day long. 
It's like high school. And then, yeah, and then go teach a class at night and tell them what I did all day long. Um, you know, this is what you're looking towards. And and again, graciously, Jill was the same way. Um, I would invite students from my class would come over and hang out. Um, what's his name? Matthew Markham. Do you know Matthew? He's he's on the show now in a capacity uh, and, and crew. But he was a student of mine. Uh, he got referred to me by them. You know, came over. But it was a whole different world. It was all about the acting. It was all about the work. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, about yeah. the work yes. every day. Yeah. And um, I mean, I was fortunate because I got to work with Ricky. Uh, also later, I went down to Florida with him. We did a movie. and um, But then I saw him in Les Mis on Broadway. Oh, wow. Dude, I got to tell you, that's where he belongs. That's On right. stage is where that's he belongs. Right. That's right. But the most recent thing I did with Ricky was the assassination of Johnny Versace. Yeah, yeah. With Edgar Ramirez yeah, and yeah, Penelope yeah. Cruz. And he was great. Yeah, he's great. You yeah. know, but he he was a, a work in progress. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, but stage, but he that, loves that's stage. where he... So before we end this, John... We <laughs> end it? Where are you going to talking about? No, I end, only get a couple, a few, you know... They tell me when to start. To, I want to talk to you yeah. about, since you brought up Tyler, you've been sober how long? It'll be uh, two years, April. Two years. Oh, so it's not, I thought it was longer. That's amazing. I, um, I got diagnosed with uh, a blood clot in my heart in 22. Um. Actually, I'd run into uh, my ex-wife, Bonnie, and she said, what the fuck happened to you? I looked horrible. I was 205, 200, you know, pounds, and it was all here, and I didn't know what was wrong with me. And um, she said, you got to go to the hospital. I said, I know. And, you know, I'm a guy. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll go. I, and it was COVID. Um, and I figured I'm putting on COVID weight. I'm sedentary. I was depressed. I'm, I'm you know, we were drinking a bottle of wine a night, you know. Bottle of wine a night. A night. No, but see, but also. Tyler was drinking a yeah, gallon and a half. And a half. <laughs> now, wait. A day. But what I is was, that real? That is no, real. So, no, I can't. I can't wrap my mind around that. But, I, that, I, but I, I forever can't. he did that, John. I know. I know. I, I, I literally can't wrap my mind around that because I was also, it got to this point with me. I was hiding little airline bottles of vodka. Yeah. I just oh, so you were drinking everything. And I was day drinking during COVID at the end, see? Now, when you have COVID, are you drinking? I didn't have COVID. I'm talking during COVID. Oh, during COVID. You didn't Look, have COVID. Look, COVID screwed me up. Uh -oh. I mean, I was teaching... I mean, when I left General Hospital, too, um, not getting up in the morning to go right down there, I mean, and coaching, uh, still keeping my coaching business and my teaching business, and I did a lot of, you know, uh, consulting for, you know, uh, career consulting yeah. and stuff like that. But there was a hole, you know, in me, not being a GH, not having that okay. purpose. Because I ran there every day. I All right. Um. But this starts way back. Yeah, way back. Now, way, this is way before. This is this was back to my childhood. Is it hereditary? No. Um, I mean, my grandfather was a maniac, uh, but uh, but I'd heard stories about you know when he went to the Italian club and he got into the grappa. You know, he was a coal miner. Both my grandfathers were coal miners. Okay. But uh, but going back to the other, I I I went to UCLA Health in uh, Santa Monica. Cardiology. I go in and uh, and it's big freaking doctor walks. Oh, the the echocardiogram guy looks at me. He goes, um, "Doctor's going to want to talk to you." I went, "Okay." I said, "Can you tell me?" He goes, "I can't tell you, but don't go anywhere. Doctor's going to want to talk to you." I'm sitting there. Guy comes out. He goes, "We're admitting you now." I went, "Okay." He said, uh, are, uh, are you, did you come here alone? So I said, no, girlfriend's across the street. Um, he goes, well, call her and tell her to meet us at emergency. We're bringing you in now. 
I said, okay. He said, you have a blood clot in your heart. I went, okay. I thought I was being really cool about this because I knew something was wrong and I'm trying not to panic. And he said, um, you had congestive heart failure a year and a half ago. He goes, that echo tells us we know exactly what happened with you. He said, I don't know how you're standing here. I mean, and I looked it up later, because he said, your heart's been working at 20% capacity for a year and a half. Damn. And I'm walking around. And, uh, and drinking. Hmm? Oh, and drinking. More drinking. Because drinking makes that worse. Well, did the follow-up. So I'm in the hospital for about a week. And uh, I'm, I'm being told, you know, about my heart. Because I said, can I walk? I, I walked in. I said, can I walk? And they were like, oh, oh you want to walk? I said, yeah, I want to walk around. I want to walk. Um, I, they came in one day, and I was doing something on the hospital bed. And they said, you're out of bed. I was like, nobody told me I can't be out of bed. So I'm walking around, and I'm saying, so what do you want to do? You, uh, I said, I want to walk some more. He goes, well, you know, your heart's at, I said, what, do you, what is this thing? He goes, your heart's at 20%, man. You know, we want to get you back in bed. I'm going to be released. I was in for not close to a week. And with this blood clot, and then we decided what we were going to do. They give me this thing called Lasix, right? It's an intravenous. I lost 25 pounds in three days. Dang. But the problem is I had to keep on it when I went home. Well, I went from 205 to down in the 150s. Wow. It just kept taking from me. And I, I told them, I said, look, either you're going to take me off this or I'm going to stop taking it. And I'm on injections every day um, uh, for uh, blood thinner and stuff. But, and this is, we're getting into this part, but um, I look like an old man. Wow. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror, and I'm like, I mean, an old man. And I was like, I'm not ready for the shit. I'm not ready for this yet. I got shit to do. I mean, my daughter was getting married. Um, I had my first grandson on the way. Oh, my man. only grandson on the way. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I said, what do I have to do? And <laughs> I start focusing on this, you know, uh, blood club. And they said, we're not going to, no surgery. And I had no, like, stints or anything. And they said, we're going to dissolve this. I was like, all right. But in the meantime, I looked at myself and I looked. It was so depressing because I looked old, man. And <laughs> I came home with a thing of Alka-Seltzer. Now, this is going to sound crazy, but I, I got a box of Alka-Seltzer. I didn't know they made it anymore. Because I'm in my head going, I have to visualize something. So every night, <laughs> I get my girlfriend, some friends, and we, I drop a thing of Alka-Seltzer in a glass of water. And I watch it dissolve. Why? Because that was my mental picture of I'm dissolving this clot. Uh, Isn't that crazy? That's, no, I like it. So I couldn't exercise. They wouldn't let me carry groceries up steps. But I started going to the park every morning with my dog. That was my thing. I would take, you know, and I started to pray. And I call myself a recovering Catholic. You know, yeah. I, grew, I grew up a Catholic. I still listened to Ronnie. And it sounded like me, the altar boy, the yeah. whole bit. And, uh, but in my education, um, I, I, was, I remember I took a beating every year in grades one through eight. I was yeah. hit by a teacher in, when I was six years old. Yeah. I mean, just slapped across the face. And they beat the God out of me. And I was so angry with them for having done that to me. But, and I was a kid then. Your dad? Uh... My dad was a staunch Catholic, so was my, my mother. But my, my mom told me that my dad had periods of, you know, but my, my dad unfortunately passed away. You had to pry the, um, the rosary beads out of his hand to get him into surgery. He, he wouldn't let go of them. I didn't have that. Yeah. I didn't have any of that. And I wanted it. You know, um, so anyway, I would go to the park in the morning, and I would pray and meditate. I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my life. 
I'm going to change how I do things. I quit drinking immediately. And uh, they actually came to me and said, have you thought about like AA and stuff? I said, no. And nothing against them. I said, I can't do that. Um, I said, I quit. And they went, okay, you're saying. And I said, I quit. I'm done. I am done. And I haven't had anything to drink since. I mean, I just quit. But I realized you cannot do this on your own. Mm -hmm. I cannot do it on my own. Mm -hmm. So I turned, I can't say I turned immediately to like to Jesus Christ or, but I turned to a higher power yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, and you know what I did? I prayed to my angels is what I did. So someone told me, a number of people told me, look, I demolished like seven cars on the way up. Jack Daniels, Quaaludes, I mean, I mean, whatever it was back in the day, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, one car after another and walked away from them. I mean, I literally woke up one night. It was so quiet. And I'm like, what the? And boom, I was in the car. I'd fallen asleep in the car, and I was in the air. I hit a thing, and it launched me. And I ended up, I got out of the car. There's a tree going through the engine block, ripped Damn. out the radiator. I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here. I got a quarter pound of weed under my arm. I just came from a club, and, uh, you know, just back in Pennsylvania. How did you learn how to meditate? Uh, well, my girlfriend meditated a lot. I'm not good at it. I'm not really good at I'm it. It's great. very difficult. Yeah, yeah. But looking at the Alka Seltzer and watching it, because I needed a visual. I I'm a very that, yeah. visual guy. And I needed something. I couldn't, and that, I just saw it going. That's really cool. And it went away. And, but I, I called up UCLA. I said, look, I need a therapist. I said, it's not fair for me to burden my friends with all my shit. And I didn't really have anybody to talk to. I called them up. I said, can you get me a therapist? And they hooked me up with this one guy. And um, I met him. And as soon as I met him, I knew, this is my guy. And we sat down and he's... What do he, you get out of a therapist? I get... Oh, man, it's a tough question. What do I get out of it? I get peace. Ah. I get peace. Right. I get the truth. Right. I get the truth. Right. I got somebody out there right, right, right. that cares about me. Right. But he's not personally involved with me. You know, he's not going to sugarcoat right, shit. Right, 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 right. And I needed that. Right. Look, my girlfriend could tell me that. My wife could have told me that. I mean, fuck you. I don't, I don't, I don't listen to anybody. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I was really thick. Well, you know me. Yes. Um, terrible temper. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't want to listen to anybody, you know? Uh, you know what you're talking about. You know, yeah, I can handle whatever. And um, and it's just not like, you know, with Tyler, uh, the rest of his soul. It's not like Tyler. I wasn't drinking a gallon and a half a day, but I was drinking daily. I would get off work, and I would I was good for a place right down the street. My, the, my watering hole was down here at the smokehouse. That's where I was. Smokehouse. Baby, that was for, for years, that was my place. Wow. And, um, but I get in, I mean, I, I loved it. And back in those days, Bombay, you know, and they'd pour you a man glass, you yeah. know. And I'm realizing, you know, you know, people tell, well, how much do you drink a day? Well, I have a beer or two. Fuck that, man. I'm, 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 yeah, pleased. yeah, of course. You know what I mean? I mean, beer to me was soda. You know, I just, you know, if I had yeah. a construction thing at the house, that I mean, a case of beer, get a case of beer while we're working. Yeah. Um, but uh, getting a, what I get out of therapy, I get validation. I'm not a, I'm not a dumb guy. And yeah. uh, I mean, intellectually, once we got the booze out of the way and no more rationalization on my part, no more fucking lying to myself, you know, because I mean, you can't lie to yourself for a while, especially when you're drinking. Let me tell you one thing, John, and maybe for you too, because we're similar in a lot of ways. I don't do the drinking and 
anything like that, thank God, because I probably wouldn't be here. Right. But with with, you know, mental illness is everything that I've gone through. One thing I just realized, and I'm I, I know I've talked about it quite a bit now, uh, is I know that if I don't fix my ego, <sighs> I'm go gone. gone. <laughs> I'm go go I'm going down down the the. It's not going to work for me in my life. Don't tell me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't you know, fucking tell exactly. me exactly. But but John, oh. I don't know where yours is. But if mine had to be measured, it's way the hell up here. Now, it doesn't mean we're not compassionate guys no. and sensitive guys. Not at all. But this other thing, but I it's taken me 60 years to figure out that that's been the main problem my whole life. My whole life. My whole life. So, uh, John, uh, you got any last words, buddy? Yeah, I mean, I got more than last. I got beginning words, middle words, end words. I got so much to talk about. And I, I know we're on, on time, but the thing about with me, and we want to go back to ego for just a second, ego is huge. Look, you have to have an ego to, to yes. succeed. You have to. Yes. I mean, I don't care what, what part of this business you're yes. in sports, whatever, to walk on that field, yeah, fuck, I'm the best. I am right. the best. As a coach, I mean, I, the best. I This is what I do, and yeah. no one can do this as, as well as I do it. Yeah. You know, what I do. Yeah. And I said, but, but that, ego, ego for acting is needed. It's and, needed. And the thing is, you know me. Yep. I don't have ego when I'm acting. I want everybody to be great. That's something that I can't even, yeah. uh, I'm like, I'm like that. Well, I said, as a, as, as a coach, one of the things I say, as an actor, you must be selfish. You must be selfish. Yeah, I get it. But I said, in order to be selfish, you must be the most generous person on that set. Right. Because if you do, you'll get it all yeah. back. But it's life where it's going to get you. Man, I mean, walking off set or walking off whatever. Life. And I mean, my wife couldn't say anything to me. No one could say anything to me. I, I knew and... and the thing and, and and leaving acting because I loved acting um, put me in a depression that I didn't even know I was in, and that's when I started really yeah. going at it. And I'm teaching, but it wasn't it wasn't getting me what I really needed, and my ego needed to be fed. And um, man, well, Burton gave me a uh, a book, uh, you know, the ego's your enemy. Mm -hmm. um, but I also read something called the Daily Stoic. Um, and it gives you a meditation a day. Yeah. yeah. It's the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning, I, I pull that. I listen to that car totally. But man, I try to get everything that happens to me. Um, I, there's no hiding, you know what I mean? This no. You think, and I, I try to bring everything into my class, you know? I want actors to know the real deal. And the deal I'm trying to get them, I'm, I'm doing a whole new mission statement. I'm, I'm reworking my whole thing because also ego, with COVID and everything, I didn't want to advertise. I didn't want to jump on. I didn't want to start asking for, you know, uh, students and this stuff. It, I, my my website is outdated. It is johnhoma.com. Uh, I mean, if you want to reach me, you want to get it right. at me. I mean, I'm on Instagram. It's Hey, it's Homa. But I'm redoing everything. I'm redoing my mission statement. Yes. I'm redoing all of this. And, and uh, Kimberly asked me, she said, what do you, in this mission statement, what's most important to you as an actor? I said, the truth. Mm -hmm. I want the truth. Mm -hmm. And we, how we go about getting mm -hmm. that truth is very, very important. And you have to tell yourself the truth. Yeah. And I was lying to myself. And this helps you lie greatly. I, know, yeah. uh, I mean, I got this thing on my thing, on my wrist now. It says, God's got this. I'm, I was meditating in part. I opened my eyes and there's a guy standing in front of me. He's staring at me, like closer than you are to me. And I was like, whoa. And he just handed me this wristband. Didn't say anything to me. Nah, just handed it to I me. I love that I stuff. put it on, and I haven't taken it off since. But the thing about the, the alcohol, you don't have to be a fall-down drunk. You don't have to be. It's making decisions when this outer force is working on you. You get pissed off, I'm going to go have a drink, I'm going to go, or you have a drink, and the decision-making is mm -hmm. the problem. Yes. You can't make the right decision if you're under the influence. No. You just cannot. 
and you get angry, you get, and then your ego feeds, yeah. and then you get pissed off and blame everybody else for all the problems you're having in the world. And then you go back and then meditate yeah, or meditate yeah, yeah. some more. Yeah. So please, anybody that's listening out there, I am back up to weight. I'm at what they call the low end of normal with my heart. I did the work and I continue to do the work every single day. I don't miss a day. You slip, I mean, you slip, your ego comes in, you get, you know, whatever. But look, if you got a problem, talk to somebody. You can do this, but every day, every day gets better with me. My health has been amazing. I mean, my cardiologist said, I told her about this kind of spiritual journey I went on. I was in I was in England. I got back and she said, Can I hug you? It's my doctor. And I said, Yeah. She said, I'm just so proud of you. That you that you've done what you've done. And you can do it. You can absolutely do it. You need help. Yeah. You know, yeah. get help. Find someone you can talk to. If it's a therapist, if it's a priest, yes. I don't care who yes. it is, man. But there is another power working here. Yes, you can. You know, um, I always say, you know, because I, I say I, in the beginning of State of Mind, I didn't talk about God a lot. Right. So I was a little nervous, right? Right. Yeah. And things are. But now I do, and because I 100% believe in God, I'm not really. I can't say I'm a practicing Christian because I'm no, not. I'm not. But yeah. So, but the the what you have to believe in something because life can be very difficult at times, and you really need some help, and you can't do it alone. You can't. It's it's just no, too difficult. Can't. And the the business that I'm in, doing what I do, I'm in a private coach. I am a teacher. I was a you know onset coach, which right. I'd love to get back to, but I am a. Uh, a confidant too. When you work with somebody as yeah. close as we used to work, yeah, you have to get in there, you know. And I mean, to you got to dig deep. The way I want to coach actors, yes. the way why I want actors to to treat their craft and their art. Because I used to not believe in the art of it. I believe in the craft of it. Yeah. I truly believe in the art of it. You got to get to the truth of it. And you got demons, man. Yes. And you got to deal with them. Yes. You know. But look at you. You know, look where you are. I heard your thing, the lithium, for how many years? Yeah, 30, 30 years, so no breakdown. My life has completely changed. My mental outlook is completely different now. All right, John. I think we've Thank covered you, everything under the... I love you, man. I love you too, brother. Um, Thank you for being here. Thank you for opening up. Thank you for not drinking. Oh. We're all proud of you right now. Thank you. State of mind, brother. All right. Thank you.